and, um, and then right next to that is the reference case. Next to that is the what we call the aggressive reference case, putting in place all the policies um, that are either in place now or being discussed. And you can see that doesn't get us to that, that horizontal bar which goes across the middle of the graph. That's our uh, emissions target. That's 40% reduction from uh, 2010 levels by 2030. So it's only the the rightmost case, the pericap case, that gets us to that emissions target. So I'll talk really briefly through this just to uh, summarize all the points that I'm hoping to summarize. Um, efficiency, we look at the building sector, the indus industry sector, and transportation. Um, and we find that uh, the, the reference case scenario, um, our energy consumption is supposed to is predicted to go up to 104 quads ballpark by 2030. Um, and we can bring that down to 70 quads, 70 quadrillion BTUs. So we can save 34 quads through energy efficiency. 14 of those, almost half, is from the building sector. Um, and then another 10 through industrial efficiency, um, combined heat and power, industry-specific investments um, in energy-intensive industries and so on. And then another eight quads in transportation. And, and here we focus mainly on um, making more fuel-efficient vehicles. We, we did look at expanding public transportation, but in the U.S. that is such a small percentage of vehicle miles traveled that um, in terms of bang for the buck, um, the, the greatest efficiency investments are in vehicles, at least in the short term. Um, so I won't go line by line through this, but, um, but we cost out based on estimates from uh, Deutsche Bank Climate Advisors and McKinsey and World Bank and uh, Energy Information Administration, a variety of public and um, private uh, resources that have looked at the cost of this energy transition, we come up with the costs for achieving these 34 quads of energy efficiency, um, and that comes out over the 20-year period to, to $1.75 trillion, or about $88 billion a year. Uh, we do the same thing in looking at renewable energy. We look at what is the not just the technically feasible amount of renewable energy, but the economically feasible amount of renewable energy we can produce in the next 20 years. Um, so we were at, in the U.S., about eight quads in 2010. The reference case scenario from the, um, the EIA expands that, almost doubles that to 15.2 quads, but a large amount of that is high emissions biomass, so uh, corn ethanol. Um, the Perry cap case expands clean energy to just about that same amount, 15.4 quads, um, but does not include any high emissions biomass. Um, so again, we look at, uh, for each type of energy, what are the costs and how many quads can we achieve. Um, the, the total cost for the 20-year program is $2.1 which comes out to about $107 billion per year. And I'm not going to take the time to go through line by line, but I'll give you links to the report at the end if you're interested. It's available for free on our website. Um, so we bring our energy consumption down from 104 quads to 70 through efficiency. Then 15 of those, or a little more than 20%, can be supplied by renewables. That leaves us with 55 quads that we have to supply through oil, coal, natural gas, and nuclear. Um, so oil, we find kind of the, the minimum, minimum, excuse me, minim, it, easy for me to say, right? Minimum amount of oil that we can rely on um, and you know, we acknowledge that we're going to need oil for transportation in the, in the short term, but we can reduce our oil consumption by 40%. Um, re eliminating oil use in buildings and electricity and just using it for transportation. Um, and then that leaves 34 quads to be supplied by coal, natural gas, and nuclear. Um, and even though natural gas is the cleanest of the fossil fuels, um, although now, I guess that's a little bit arguable since fracking has greater methane emissions. It may not be as uh, clean in comparison to the other fossil fuels as the, the estimates that we all work with show. Um, but there is nonetheless a 30% reduction in natural gas consumption in our scenario and a 60% reduction in coal use. Um, and nuclear power declines only slightly to, and remains around eight quads. Um, so. These are the various energy consumption scenarios. Um, 
the rightmost being the peri cap case. So then we look at uh, the question of jobs. Uh, so we use an input output model which captures the overall cost of that. Yes, is about is about 200 billion per year, um, and I won't go into exactly the the. Uh, the details of those costs, but about 50 billion of that is public, and about 150 billion of that is private. So the 50 billion that's public, some of that is um, direct investment in retrofitting public buildings, putting renewable energy installations on public lands and public buildings and so on. Um, but a good amount of that is uh, tax incentives and financial incentives for private investment. Um, so the, the 50 billion of public leverages an additional 150 billion of private for an annual total of about 200 billion. Um, so then we look at that annual cost of 200 billion dollars, what's happening job-wise job with those 200 billion. Um, so we know that there's going to be an increase in employment in clean energy. There will also be a contraction in employment in fossil fuel industries. Um, so we use the input-output model, which captures three levels of job creation. So it has the, the direct jobs that are created in the energy industries themselves, the indirect jobs that are created throughout the supply chain, and then the induced jobs that are created through the spending multiplier. So the workers in clean energy and in the supply chain spending their paychecks and creating additional jobs in retail and healthcare and education and so on. Um, so uh, we, we take that $200 billion of costs and map it into the input-output model. So um, using, you know, well, I won't, I won't get into the methodology. I, I can uh, answer questions if anybody's interested in that afterwards. But essentially, we look at what are the industries involved in manufacturing, installing, providing services for renewable energy um, and energy efficiency like R&D and engineering and so on. Um, we also estimate the jobs related to ongoing operations and, and maintenance um, in addition to those initial capital um, investment jobs. Um, so uh, the net change in employment, we find that through, uh, through the initial investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy, we can create on average, about uh, 1.4 million jobs. Uh, sorry, about 1.9 million jobs. That's line three on that upper section. Um, and then uh, the contraction, if we were to, to shift dollar per dollar from fossil fuels into clean energy, um, the, the number of jobs we would lose in fossil fuels would be about 800,000. So we would net 1.1 million jobs as a, an annual average for that 200 billion. Um, and then if we did the same thing at, in operations and maintenance, so that it's a dollar for dollar shift from fossil fuels into clean energy, um, we would net an additional 1.5 million jobs. And a lot of that, the, a lot of those 1.5 million jobs are in bioenergy. So we don't include high emissions biomass, but we do include cellulosic biomass, um, energy from landfill gas, and, and those, kinds of, um, those kinds of bioenergy. And uh, the, the, the labor intensity of those industries is much higher than fossil fuels, so there's a big job increase there. Um, the, the policies, I won't go line by line again, but essentially there are four groups of policies. There are the market shaping rules, the direct public spending, the private investment incentives, and, um, and then we also include regional equity and worker transition assistance. So assistance to the fossil fuel communities that are losing jobs um, and you know, worker tr retraining programs, financial assistance, and so on. Um, so global green growth, I'll just take one or two minutes um, and then our next speaker can start. Essentially, we do the same thing in five other countries. So we look at Brazil, Germany, Indonesia, South Africa, and South Korea. And so these are you know, five countries with, with different levels of development, different natural resources, different energy mixes. Um, and, um, and we look at reducing, you know, so when, when we talk globally about reducing energy, uh, excuse me, reducing emissions by 40%, um, that certainly doesn't mean that each country needs to reduce their own emissions by 40%, since countries that are at different levels of development um, have contributed different amounts of carbon emissions uh, 
cumulatively. Um, and so what we do is we decompose that emissions per capita so that the last line, the equation, on the bottom, emissions per capita is a result of three things. Um, first, it's GDP per capita, so a level of economic development. Next, it's energy consumption per GDP, so a level of energy intensity. And third, emissions per uh, energy consumption, per unit of energy consumption, so the level of emissions intensity. So when we're looking at reducing emissions per capita, we don't necessarily need to um, stop or reduce economic growth. In some countries, we, that, that may be the best, um, the best way forward, but for developing countries, they can increase their GDP per capita if they're more than um, offsetting that by decreasing energy efficiency, uh, excuse me, energy intensity, and decreasing emissions intensity. So becoming more energy efficient and shifting energy to lower carbon sources. Um, so I'll give a quick example. If you look um, at Germany and South Africa, so fourth from the bottom and, and second from the bottom, if you look at their emissions per capita, Germany at 9.7 metric tons per person, South Africa 9.5 metric tons per person, so pretty equivalent in terms of emissions per capita. Obviously, Germany's uh, level of economic development is much higher, $41.5,000 um, per person, South Africa, $7,500 per person. Um, but Germany, then if you look at the next column over, has a much lower energy intensity than South Africa, and if you look at the final column, has a much lower emissions intensity than South Africa. So the goal for South Africa is not to, to hinder development in any way, but to bring down the energy intensity and to, to bring down the emissions intensity by shifting to lower carbon sources. And I think I'm going to stop there because I don't want to go too far over time. I had some example slides for Indonesia. But um, again, all of this is available in um, these two reports. The first one is green growth. That's the US-based one that I spent most of the time talking about. And then global green growth, um, looking at the five other countries. So those are on our, our website. Um, my email is here. If you have any questions after the conference that you want to follow up with. And um, we'll, we'll have two more presentations, and then we'll take some time for Q&A. Um, so I will call up um, Sung Jewel next. Yes, thank you. I couldn't get it to work. So, fifteen minutes. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Sung Jewel Sa. The title of the paper is Difficulty of Climate Change Negoci Negotiations and the Prison of Dilemma Game. Um, so this paper uh, will talk about uh, climate change and about um, reducing greenhouse gases. The international community has been working many years to reduce uh, greenhouse gases, but it seems that um, the progress is very, very slow. So, uh, that is the uh, main question. In fact, uh, to, to me, there's no, uh, not much of a progress at all uh, in reducing greenhouse gases. So the main question I'm asking in this paper and this presentation is why? Why is it so slow? Why uh, aren't we doing uh, fast enough? Why, why, why aren't we reducing it fast enough? Um, so that is the main question. The possible explanation that may be is that Individual country may not have incentive to reduce greenhouse gases. Maybe it's just other countries should do it, but except me. That might be a main reason. So this attitude or situation is well uh, explained and uh, hardens uh, the tragedy, tragedy of the commons. So in this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about hardens uh, the tragedy of the commons or call it the Harden's uh, game or prisoner's dilemma game. And um, remedy uh, with transfer, I'll briefly mention those. So transfer, and, and in other words, that uh, some penalty, if you impose some penalty, we can change the game. So in a new game, you can avoid the tragedy. Or 
Then this, the third one I'm talk, uh, I'd like to talk about is if we can change the game and we can get a better outcome, we can avoid the tragedy, why don't we do it? So the answer might be is that their hardest game, maybe not the game you're playing. So that is the, the question I'm asking. And if that is not the case, then maybe we need a, a new explanation for it. So I, I'll try to provide um, a new explanation. OK, that is the plan, uh, this paper. Um, so let's look at the, um, the tragedy of the Commons Harden uh, paper. He um, says the following. He said, picture a pasture open to all, since the fact or the cause of overgrazing are shared by all the herdmen. The rational herdsman concludes that the only sensible course for him to pursue is to add another animal to his herd, and another, and another. Therein is the tragedy. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit, in a world that is limited. If we put it in, in the context of climate change, uh, we can say that the rational individual country concludes that the only sensible course for the country to pursue is to pollute more and more. Therein is the tragedy. That might be uh, the discussion of the problem we have now. So that's why the progress might be very slow. Uh, another. Um, Another quote he has is, ruin is the destination toward which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the common. So one thing important here is each, oops, sorry, each pursuing his own best interest. So each country is pursuing his best own interest. That's why it might be so difficult, because individual incentive, following individual incentive, lead to the ruin. So pursuing its own best interest, maybe economists believe in this. Economists believe that following this selfish interest, then the market will take, take care of it, so the society will get the good outcome. But in this case, we'll do the opposite. Um, so. Starting from this, we, I will represent the, the tragedy of the commons in a game. Simple to uh, noting that when we add one more cow or we uh, increase the pollution, uh, greenhouse gases, there are two effects. One is benefit, which is private, and the other one is cost, which is public, which means other countries have to pay. So paying attention to this, um, we can introduce the, the problem, uh, the hardened game uh, here. So this is uh, very simple here. It's, uh, we consider two countries, and two countries have two possible choices, a bait, a pollute. Um, it, this is a symmetric game. So the country two also has the same uh, possible choices. Um, depending on the uh, choices made by the two countries, there are corresponding payoffs. Uh, this is very simple. The payoff starting from zero, one, two, three. The best possible outcome payoff is three. Worst possible one is zero. But collectively, the best one is a bait and a bait, which is two and two. And then collectively, the worst one is pollute and pollute. But when we look at the profit gain and public cost, let's look at the country one. Um, if country one change from the strategy or choice of bait to pollute, which is arrow, the, the show arrow, um, green arrow shows, what happened is country one's payoff increases from two to three or zero to one. So there's a uh, uh, private gain. But for country two, what happened is country two's payoff goes from two to zero and th or three to one, depending on what, uh, where, what kind of choice uh, the country one is making. So there's a minus two, which is cost. 
So paid by country two. So country one said, well, I, I care only about my, my uh, payoff. Why should I care your payoff? So in that case, country one's best choice is to pollute instead of abate, right? While country two is the same. This is what economists call rational choice. Because the problem is because we are rational. That's why we have the problem in this game, in this uh, Harden's game. So for example, when we have uh, in, uh, in 2011, you pulled out of Kyoto Accord, and then they said, Canada saved $14 billion. Well, it might be rational choice. For, so Canada may have gained. If this is true, if this is the game we're playing, Canada may have gained at the cost of other country. But later, if I have time, I'll talk about this. In fact, Canada maybe didn't gain anything. Maybe they lost because uh, we'll, I'll talk about later non-economic gain. If we consider uh, non-economic gain, maybe the gain you're talking about here, $14 billion, may, may, be, may, be, may not represent the whole thing. So, um, so a rational decision maker, rational decision making or following the best interest, individual best interest, may lead to the disaster, uh, in other words, uh, the ruin, as the outcome one and one. While if they chose abate and abate, then they could have gotten two, both. But pollute is always individually best or better, we call it dominant strategy, the best choice. So this is the problem. Now, um, given that, can we get out of this? Well, is it possible we can move from this choice, pollute and pollute, to abate and abate, so that each country receives uh, $2 each. By the way, this number here, 0, 1, 2, 3, doesn't have much meaning here. Uh, just a uh, relative uh, payoff is, uh, the comparison is important. So is it possible both receive $2? Well, it is possible if we can change the game. It's simple. We can introduce transfer or penalty. Then we can um, change the game. Um, so um, there's, I introduced some other um, the new game or change in the game um, with, the, uh, with the transfer. But I, I'm, I'm going to skip the, this part and I introduce some uh, sequential move game and then look at the, uh, the equilibrium outcome there. And then the resulting outcome, if you introduce a penalty, then what happens is um, the game uh, let me go back to, given the penalty, the best choice now become a bait. Uh, well, it's, I think it might be it's hard to uh, look at the number. Um, the, here, the, the first number, I, I'm sorry, I didn't do this very carefully with this game. So the first number is crossed one to country one's payoff, the second number country two's payoff. So um, if you look at it carefully, Abate is the best choice for uh, both countries. So it'll be the, the, the outcome will be uh, the higher outcome once we introduce penalty. Right. Um, then the question I'm asking here is, if it's possible, if it's possible that we can change the game and then get the better outcome, then what, why don't we do this? Do this? So starting from Harden's game, we can change the game by introducing um, penalty, and we can get a better outcome. But we are not doing it. Well, maybe the, uh, the answer is follow. Maybe the Harden's game is not what you're playing. In other words, the current situation is not represent, maybe not represented by the, uh, this game, uh, the prisoner dilemma game. Um, and the prisoner dilemma game may be not adequate in describing the current situation. Um, so I'd like to um, talk about this. And 
a gardener in his book, A Perfect Moral Stone, The Ethical Tragedy of Climate Change, he said this, um, the game is a prisoner dilemma game or Arden's game is not adequate to deal with the issue of ethics present and the problem of global climate changes, such as the plight of the global poor and the exclusion of future generations. And he also said that, I conclude that the basic tragedy of the commons model is at best seriously, seriously incomplete. The mo models neglect of differences and vulnerability and especially the plight of the global poor means that it's, it obscures vital features of a problem at hand. So basically he's saying that uh, the Hardens game or the prisoner dilemma game is not adequate. And we have to consider the, the division of the society, poor, uh, rich, or current generation and next generation. So those groups, some of the group are ignored. So if I consider, um, say, the, uh, in this presentation, I'll only consider um, just uh, what is the rich, rich and the poor, or a name 99% of top 1%, it seems that there's a really big gap between 1% or 99%. So there's some number there. For example, um, it says that 85 richest people have as much wealth as the poorest 50%. Seems to be a big number there. And then the top 1% of people globally will own more than half of all wealth. So it seems to be huge. Um, so there's a big gap, if you notice. And in addition to considering a two group, uh, we can consider that to gain or loss, economic gain and non-economic gain. Um, often, non-economic gains are uh, ignored. So when we divide the group, uh, the society into the two groups, um, the top 1% prefer pollute, assuming that pollute, uh, this policy, has implication of more, better, faster growth. So their uh, uh, wealth may grow faster. Mm -hmm. So we assume that economic gain, the one person gain from pollute and lose from abate. And on the contrary, the 99% gain from abate, and this is non-economic gain, and lose from pollute. So as the preferences, the preferences are opposite between the 1% and uh, 99%. When we, when we consider this, um, we can, the one thing I'd like to mention, as, as I just mentioned, uh, usually we ignore the non-economic gains. Um, so when you talk about, uh, as I just mentioned, a $14 billion, it may not include any of non-economic gains or loss uh, the, the people has. So suppose that we add, non-economic gains to the economic gain. So we divide into two groups and they, they uh, accept, uh, they uh, receive different uh, payoff. So um, when we aggregate, um, how much do we have? Only two minutes? Okay. <laughs> All right, so now, um, when we aggregate, depending on um, which groups dominate, which groups that uh, payoff dominate. So um, we have, uh, three possible cases. But here I only consider one and two. Case one, the non-economic gains are lost by the 99% to outweigh the economic gains are lost. In this case, the abate is the best choice for the country. So the, the best choice is abate for the 99% for the and the country's best choice is also abate. This is one um, case one, and this, uh, there are three cases, but I'll, not, I'll, I'll skip case uh, third one. And then the second case is Hardin's gain. When we aggregate, it came out to be the game we just started. This is the original game, this Hardin's game. So now the question is, we are asking is if Suppose that case one is the true uh, reality. Is the represent the true, 
the current situation, then the, the best choice is a bait for the country. And yet, we are observing that. We are not uh, selecting that. We are more likely, we, uh, we, we are selecting pollute. How do we explain that? The reason may be, the reason is because we are ignoring the economic, non-economic gain. We only consider economic gain part. So the question is, if uh, among the two possible cases, case one and then the other one is uh, Harden's gain, which one represents the true uh, reality of the uh, situation? Um, well, the answer has been uh, the second case. The hardened game represents the reality. That's why we, we select pollute. But if we consider, but case one, one may be true. In fact, the country one's best choice may be a bait, not, not the pollute. But we select, instead of uh, best choice, cho a choice, a bait. We are still looking to pollute because we're ignoring the non-economic gains. So the the one percent um, dominate when decision making, when a society makes decision, is made by the one percent. That might be a simplest way to put it. But when you explain it, well, maybe you're playing the hardens game. So the real game is case one, and the decision made by the one percent. But when you explain this, well, it is case two. So it's all three cases might be that that's what we are all mixed up. That's, that's what we are doing. So we're going back to, uh, let me just, one minute, let me just think. Going back to the original question, why is it so difficult to reduce ingredients of gases? Maybe because the, the, change, the problem of climate change is not the, the problem of misdirected individual incentive. As which has shown in Harden's game, maybe it's a problem of the distribution of income, the unequal, unequal income distribution, and the unequal distribution of power and unequal representation of interest. That might be the problem. If, if this is a problem, how can you fix this? Fixing is not easy. Before, I talked about the transfer of penalty. Introducing penalty, if it's Harden's game, Introducing penalty, we can. We may be able to change the game. But if the problem is the, if, if the problem is not, it's, is this uh, in countries, the, between the rich and poor, if a distribution problem, simply introducing transfer cannot fix the problem. So between, uh, transfer is between the country. But the problem is in the country, that because of the division, uh, because of the conflict of interest be between the two or more groups. So uh, that's why maybe it's, uh, it's harder to fix. All right. Um, and so said, fixing the problem is not easy. And uh, as Gardner pointed out, the climate change problem, maybe it's a problem ethic, not economic problem. So if it's not a kind of problem, maybe the uh, uh, economic theory or uh, economists may not be able to do handle this problem. So uh, let me finish this. Uh, with, uh, it might be nice to add non-economic gains or loss in our calculation. So uh, to do that, we may have to quantify uh, the non-economic gains. Normally, it's a very hard job, and normally we ignore this part. But if quantify, if you add this, aggregate, then we, um, we may be able to see whether case one is really uh, representing the current situation. By doing so, we may be able to include uh, the poorer or the next generation of future generation in our decision making. Okay. Thank you. We have one more presentation um, from Philip Siriani, is that right? Uh, and then we should have a few minutes at the end for some Q&A.
Hey, thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about an ongoing project uh, today, one that um, we have uh, carried out at um, the State University of New York at Oneonta. Um, this is a joint project um, with uh, Bill O'Day, who was also uh, a professor of uh, economics in our department, and also uh, Zach Van Eerden, uh, who was a student. He's, uh, he graduated um, at this point, but uh, helped us uh, with this project. Um, unfortunately, um, I just, we, we ran the survey that I'm going to talk about um, uh, recently, and unfortunately, uh, I just got that data for that last week and wasn't able to compile all of it, but I'll present um, uh, some of the results uh, for you. Um, let me talk about the, um, the purpose of the project. Um, so what we were aiming to do uh, was to use an online transportation survey uh, to estimate the emissions from all the commuters to uh, SUNY Oneonta. Um, when colleges compile their greenhouse gas inventory reports for purposes of things like AISHI STARS program, which maybe some of you are familiar with, or um, the uh, President's Climate Commitment, uh, for example, um, one of the things uh, that colleges have difficulty with is, is reporting scope three emissions. So um, emissions are generally, uh, in, the, in these reports, uh, divided into three scopes. Scope one, uh, those are direct emissions that would come from, say, um, in-house power generation or in-house waste incineration, um, uh, fleet, uh, uh, vehicle fleets uh, that are operated by the institution. Um, scope two are indirect emissions, so that's a uh, major component of scope two emissions is um, purchased electricity, uh, heating and cooling. Um, scope three emissions, on the other hand, are, are uh, very difficult to estimate. A large component of that comes from commuting uh, to campus. So in our um, recent uh, report, or the report um, uh, that was done prior to the one that is now using uh, the data from our survey. Um, when they compiled the, the scope three emissions from commuters, they basically just said, okay, let's just assume average, average, average. Everybody drives five miles to campus, everybody's got a mid-size car, average MPG, sort of just average across the board so that we can fill in a number here. Um, and if you look at some of the greenhouse gas inventory reports for, for colleges and universities that are available um, on the President's Climate Commitment uh, website, um, I have looked through that. Um, I did a, uh, I had a project um, recently. Whoop, why am I not on the same slide that's uh, showing up on my screen? You know? hmm. Can't seem to. Uh, oh, just me. oh, you're yeah. out of the slideshow mode, so. Where do you want to be right here? Uh, here, purpose. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Why don't we go to, um, did you copy that PDF file too? Uh, or no? no, just the, let's close it and start. Okay, I think uh, maybe yeah. I have it now. All right. Okay, Great. all right. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Um, so, where was I? So, uh, I was talking about the, um, the scope three emissions that colleges have uh, difficulty estimating. If you look at these greenhouse gas inventory reports that colleges put together, um, scope three category, if you look from year to year to year, some schools just put the same number, and then you look at the next year and it's the same number, the next year it's the same. Other schools just leave it blank altogether. They don't even bother trying to fill it in. Um, so we recognize this, um, as uh, uh, my co-author uh, Michael O'Hara 
and I on a, on a different project. And so we thought that maybe a, a survey uh, using a, a transportation survey um, might be a, a way of more accurately um, capturing um, that, uh, that particular category of emissions. Um, the key factors being the miles um, that you would drive, the type of vehicle, number of trips, um, et cetera. And um, as uh, an economist, um, an environmental economist, or I was interested uh, not only in that operational aspect um, of the project, but also, or of the survey, but also um, maybe having some questions on there about the commuter's willingness to pay uh, for the uh, environmental impacts associated with their commutes. Um, and then as a follow-up, um, what are the factors that may, uh, that may correlate uh, with individuals' willingness to pay? Um, so just the findings, I think this slide was up there before, so you probably already uh, have read these. So um, in the previous greenhouse gas inventory report for the institution, um, where we just kind of assumed average across the board, um, the uh, findings were uh, 5,000, um, uh, uh, 5 um, metric tons of CO2, and uh, now we're at uh, 7.4, so 50% higher um, given the, uh, with our survey. Um, results. We also found 40% of respondents said that they would be willing to pay a voluntary contribution to internalize the external damages associated with their um, commutes, which cover about 20% of the total environmental uh, impact. Um, and uh, we also did some analysis, uh, some econometric analysis, to see what um, uh, willingness to pay varied with. and. Um, uh, we think that it varies as anticipated, which maybe provides some, uh, some evidence that, uh, that the respondents were um, answering truthfully. Uh, I'll present those to you in just a minute. So, um, so this link went out to the entire campus community. This was uh, faculty, uh, staff, and students um, from the mid, uh, mid to the end of April. Um, there was a little bit of enticement to answer the survey. Um, uh, user IDs uh, were collected. They were not viewed by uh, us, the, uh, the principal investigators, but maintained by um, a third party and um, extracted the user IDs um, to those who responded yes to a question about wanting to participate in a drawing. And then there, were, uh, there was about $500 in some, uh, some prize money. Uh, Dragon dollars are uh, <coughs> um, sort of like gift cards um, that can be used all around uh, the town of Oneonta, different restaurants, uh, uh, bookstores, and, and on campus as well. Um, and so we had 765 uh, respondents. Our institution is about 7,000 in total. Um, 320 were actual commuters. We couldn't distinguish between commuters and, and resident students. We couldn't just send the link out to, um, to those students who are commuters. So um, the link went out to everyone. If, uh, if they were not a commuter, then it uh, basically took them to the question, do you want to enter the drawing? Okay, so um, this was the preamble. Um, I've highlighted in red here um, some of the more important um, uh, aspects to this. So we tell them what the purpose of the survey is, is to gather um, information about the total carbon emissions associated with the commutes of campus, and then whether you would make a voluntary contribution. And um, so we were making it clear, uh, trying to make it clear here, and, and we did have a comment section where people could indicate whether it was clear or not. Um, the, if, in order for, you know, to, to, for this to, uh, uh, to work, um, have any kind of environmental impact, you have to use that funds. It can't just go into a general uh, fund, you know, the college's endowment or something like that. It would be those funds specifically, we told the respondents, would be used to offset um, the emissions associated uh, with their commutes, such as by purchasing um, carbon offsets or um, going into some kind of green power uh, fund. Okay, so this is just to kind of show you uh, some of the questions that we asked. We asked questions about um, uh, gender, what school that they were in. Uh, that's the lower uh, right-hand corner, whether they were in arts and sciences, social science, economics and business, education, natural science, or other. Those would be people on campus who don't identify with any uh, particular school. Um, we asked questions about income. That's the upper right. And then uh, the affiliation, which is the lower, uh, the lower left, um, as well as um, uh, the gender. So um, we think that 
we have a pretty good, uh, based on this, we think we had a, a pretty good cross-section of, uh, of the institution. Um, it might look like we have a disproportionately large number of females responding to the survey, um, but our institution is, um, the student body is approximately 60% uh, female, 40% male. Uh, we also asked uh, political affiliation. Um, we thought that in terms of looking at the correlation between willingness to pay and other uh, demographic uh, factors, political affiliation would be something um, that would be uh, interesting. And we also asked about their uh, knowledge um, of and stance on uh, uh, the issue of, uh, of global warming. Um, <clears throat> I should point out, uh, this is one of the questions uh, in, the, in the more recent version of this survey uh, that I don't, I have the data on my computer but haven't filtered through it yet. Um, we changed this question. I did not like this question on this version um, uh, of the survey. Um, you take a look at the, at the bottom there. We asked, do you think that this is an important issue? You can see, um, what is it, 86% uh, said it is an important issue. But I think the question, maybe it wasn't a very clear question because that was it, yes or no. Do you think it's important, not important? Um, you might think that it's an important thing to talk about because global warming is real, but you also might think that it's an important thing to talk about because global warming maybe uh, is not real, right? So it's kind of a, um, maybe a bad question. So what we did was we actually changed it to a quiz. Um, uh, this question about the familiarity, um, we changed that to basically which of the following statements um, best describes uh, global warming, and then we had uh, uh, several choices. So, but like I said, I haven't had a, um, a chance to look at all of that yet. Um, so here's the commute data of the 320 commuters. So on average, people make uh, 2.3 trips per day, um, and the number of miles per trip is about 11.6. Um, 11, 11 um, <clears throat> the top uh, pie chart shows the, uh, the various um, types of vehicles. Um, Majority of people uh, said that they have a, a compact car at 41%. Uh, That's the orange um, handful of people with uh, light and heavy pickup trucks on the on the other end. All right. So how do we calculate the um, the environmental um, impact? Um, so once we have the data from uh, from the survey, we can extract some of the information to. Uh, to calculate that, so we use the average miles per gallon uh, of the year and type of vehicle driven. So we ask them what kind of vehicle and what year of the vehicle it was. And then using um, some tables provided on the, the EPA website, we calculate the following. So first, we um, can calculate the number of uh, gallons of gasoline used over the um, over the academic year, which would be uh, miles per trip times trips per day times days per week, 30 weeks in a um, in a, uh, a an academic year divided by the miles per gallon. Emissions um, using those conversion uh, factors there, and then um, the uh, environmental uh, damages uh, of 20 cents uh, uh, per gallon. So that leads to um, the table at the bottom. Um, gallons, uh, of, on average, people use about uh, 261 uh, gallons, uh, two uh, metric tons of CO2 per year, and the uh, external damages are approximately uh, $52. Um, per year, you can see there's one person uh, with uh, 775. That's the the max. Um, I think I know who that might be, actually. <clears throat> Um, okay, so uh, so then we presented them with that dollar amount for their specific um, uh, vehicle and trips and all of that. So we asked, uh, now that you know the environmental impact of your commute, would you be willing to pay? And then they were presented with that dollar amount um, on top of the normal parking fee. And at this point, we also reminded them um, that uh, this is not going into a general fund, that this would be um, used to offset the um, college's overall environmental impact from uh, from commuting, and about 40% uh, uh, said yes, and about 60% said uh, no, that they were uh, that they would not be willing to pay. Um, so then, what we wanted to look at was the uh, um, the correlation between um, willingness to pay and the uh, the other questions that we asked in a survey. And so, I think that um, a majority of these probably um, the results are are um, you know not not very striking. 
Um, people said they would be more likely uh, to be willing to pay if they had a greater familiarity with uh, climate change, although I think there's kind of an issue with those climate change questions. But if they had a smaller car, if they had higher income, uh, they would be more likely and they were less likely to be willing to pay if their damages were, uh, were greater, they were less likely to say yes. Um, and also if they identified as um, conservative to independent um, on the uh, political spectrum. Um, one thing uh, that maybe was, um, I guess a, maybe a, a, uh, something we didn't necessarily expect was that there was no significant difference um, in likelihood uh, across subject areas or, uh, or affiliation with the institution once controlling for, um, for other factors. So those are the logit and probit results for all the econometricians in the crowd. Um, so then we come to the, uh, the last part here, which is the, um, the calculation of the, uh, of the scope three emissions. So we basically uh, then extrapolated the survey results to estimate the emissions um, of all commuters to campus. Uh, so um, we got the data on uh, how many uh, administration staff, how many faculty, how many student uh, parking permits um, were issued and then um, broke it down accordingly. So you can see the, the number of permits there in the second column for each of those three uh, categories. Approximately 20% of students, um, student permit holders actually live on campus, so they would not be, um, not be uh, calculated in the overall, uh, this is only, only for uh, commuters to campus, so uh, non-resident uh, non uh, students. Um, so, so those were excluded, and you can see kind of uh, results kind of make sense here. You know, the students tend to live uh, much closer to campus, so on average, um, their emissions are uh, about 1.4 uh, metric tons. Faculty uh, tend to live the farthest away, um, so theirs are about uh, three. So that's where we came up with that number that I presented you at the beginning. So, um, so based on the EPA's um, uh, environmental. Um, uh, impact associated with a gallon of gas of about 20 cents. Um, this would be associated with about $185,000 in environmental damages for the campus. Um, and if 20% of that was covered uh, from, the, uh, from the sample, if people would be willing to pay, uh, if that's true of the whole, um, then it's possible that this uh, hypothetical fund um, could raise uh, $37,000. And I think that this maybe is a if people are responding to it truthfully, perhaps is a, a, a low range estimate um, because we were only asking if you'd be willing to pay yes or no. Um, it's possible you might not be willing to pay $50, but you might be willing to pay $20, say, on top of your, uh, on top of your normal uh, parking fee. And again, in the, in the recent version, that was something that we did, uh, we did ask. We asked the binary yes, no, and then, um, what, what is the maximum amount? It was a drop-down menu with different ranges, one to five dollars, five to ten dollars, and so on. So maybe at the IC conference uh, next year I can present those results. Okay, so just in conclusion, um, the transportation survey, uh, we think it can be a useful tool for estimating both the willingness to pay for carbon emissions um, and total emissions of commuters, and we're uh, talking right now um, with our uh, sustainability coordinator at the institution of actually setting this fund up, which I think would be, uh, uh, which would be great and really enhance this, the economics part of this project as well if we can actually, um, uh, if we can actually see if uh, the, the results um, do uh, kind of line up uh, with um, people's actu actual contributions, if what they say they're willing to do actually lines up with, with the um, actual contributions. So, um, so that's all. Um, thank you. Do we have another speaker? Skype now?